So like I said, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about worship this morning. Um, and I really made the decision uh, to uh, do it for sure. Uh, a week ago, Wednesday, I think it was, we had our worship night. And uh, we had over 500 people here just came to worship. That's, that's all we did. It reminded me of years past. So we have so many new people in the church, I thought it would be a good idea for me just to kind of go through our history a little bit and my history. And um, anyway, I was raised in a church. My dad was a pastor, Lutheran pastor. He pastored in a pastor St. Louis Lutheran Church in La Mesa. At that time, they probably had six to 800, 600 people, a good 600 plus people coming on Sunday morning in the early 60s. That was a big church, big church. Really didn't have any mega churches at that time. That was a mega church. Um, and as a young boy and as an adolescent, I went to church. And in those days, uh, you went to church. You didn't have kids' church. You sat there. And if you didn't uh, behave, you know, not only did you get a rap for your mother, you also got, got in trouble when you get home from the preacher. Anyway, all those years. Standing up, sitting down, reciting liturgy, singing liturgy. I was bored out of my mind, all right? Now, years of going to Sunday school, my, my parents sacrificed and sent me to a Christian school. I learned a lot about God. And I don't want to underestimate this. I really appreciate what my, fa what my family did for me. They made sure that I knew what the Bible said about every aspect of life. But, at, but then I became a young man, about 18. I graduated. I went to college, even a little before that. I came to the conclusion that if God did exist, okay, if he did exist, because I started to question whether he had ex even existed, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. Just, he was up there somewhere, but he really didn't break into our world ever. And he certainly never had any interaction with his people. All those years in church, that's the conclusion I came to. Now, years later, so I started living my own life. Years later, I found myself in Santa Cruz, California, getting stoned out of my, my mind with all kinds of stuff. I don't want to get into that. And my friend comes up to me and said he found these mushrooms in, in the forest. What an idiot. And uh, turns out they were highly poisonous, OK? I took these things, and uh, I don't want to go into the great uh, story, except it's Thanksgiving. My parents and the whole family is sitting down for Thanksgiving dinner. They have a call from their eldest son, me, who calls him and says, I'm dying. I'm sorry. I'm afraid. Um, can you forgive me? Well, well how, <laughs> if you can imagine. Uh, my heart feels like a starter motor. I can't see colors anymore. I only see black and white. Pray for me. And then I couldn't say anymore, and the phone went dead. Think about that. Um, that was a blessing. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, they got on the phone. My aunt lived across the street. They got on two phones. They called as many people as possible. In just enough short time, hundreds of people were praying for me. Um, my good friend, I don't know how good a friend he was, who had went and you know, showed me pictures. And I picked up, when you're stoned, how many of you know you're not making good decisions? Anyway, um, he was sitting there next to me. Uh, and that's another story. I can't go into that. And as an answer to prayer, God's, God came powerfully with his Holy Spirit. And this friend of mine didn't know anything about God. He, he was, his parents were marginally Episcopalian. He went to church maybe Christmas and Easter, didn't know anything. And all of a sudden, he blurts out, God's here. And I'm thinking, during your darn tootin' he's here. <laughs> and these waves came out from heaven into our bodies and out. And I can't, you know, I, I know what happened. And so did my friend John. A few minutes later, we were completely well. Completely. Completely healed. Nothing. Now, okay, so I was stunned, guys. I have, to, I have to move faster. I was absolutely stunned. God is real. You understand? I, I mean, I had already concluded that he wasn't. I was stunned. I was walking around Santa Cruz. I called my father up, and, of course, I told him, Jesus came and all this, and he just wanted me to go to the hospital. He thought, oh, now he's really flipped. Um, but I was stunned. I had encountered God. He existed. 
I'd experienced him. And my, <laughs> and this thought kept coming, my parents were actually right. My parents were right. God exists. Um, so I, I went, you know, I started going to church, got very involved in church, and um, <clears throat> a while, I don't know how long, six months to a year, got very involved in uh, youth ministry there at, at, my, at my father's church, and somebody invited me to go to a church they went to, and I walked in, and first of all, the people were too friendly. I said, There's something wrong here. They're just way too friendly. And um, so, uh, worship, you know, the service started, worship started, and people all stood. Okay, well, I've seen this before. But then they all raised their hand and they started singing. And when halfway through that song, I felt the same presence of God that I felt and said, why am I crying? Oh, good gracious. Anyway, I felt the same presence of God that I had felt in Santa Cruz years earlier. Of course, I started weeping. And uh, anyway, when the service was, was over, how many of you know I was there the following week? I was there on Wednesday. I was there to that church every time the doors were open. And, and my dad just couldn't understand. Why don't you, why are you going there all the time? You should go. I said, I tried to explain, Dad, I don't know how to tell you this, but the Spirit has got there. The Spirit of God's there. Well, the Spirit of God's with us. But Dad, I, I couldn't explain it to him. And I went back to that church, not because of the teaching, not because of the people, believe me, and not, not because of any other thing except God's presence was there. I can't emphasize to you enough how, in, how important this was to my brother Mark and I when we started our two churches. We both had small groups of people, maybe about a dozen, and the main reason why we were getting together was to worship God. The thought of starting a church really wasn't uh, the reason why we got together. It just kind of morphed into that, and there's a whole lot more to that that I could say, but I don't have time. We found out in those early days how important worship was. I started a church, Mark started a church, and then we brought the two churches together. But even in those early years, we understood that worship anoints everything. If you worship before you preach a message, if you worship before you speak to kids, if you worship before you do anything, it's different. God's anointing comes. We learned from John chapter 4, I'm sure, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, Jesus said if you're going to worship God, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. The word worship there is proskuneo in the Greek, and it means to fall down, prostrate yourself, completely submit yourself to someone or something. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to worship God, if you're going to prostrate yourself down, you're going to give him everything, you, you can do that, but you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. We learned that worship is an action. It's a verb. We learned that, as Jesus said, worship has to be done with a foundational truth, grounded in God's truth, grounded, uh, grounded in the truth of God. In other words, a commitment to this word. If you want to worship God, you first and foremost, as you worship, you are submitted to his word. Secondly, he said it's done in the spirit. Now, this is interesting. We found that in the Greek, it says the spirit, but there, there is uh, no definite article in the front of spirit. That means just that... Um, the writer is not talking, Jesus is not talking about, and, and, and the scribe was not talking about, John, when he wrote this down, was not talking about the Holy Spirit. He was talking about your spirit, my spirit. You and I have to worship God in our spirit. What is that? Well, we've come to, I, we came to the conclusion, it was what who makes us us, your emotions, your will, your mind. When you worship God, you have to surrender your emotions, your will, your mind to God. All that is your, uh, Lord, I, su I submit all my, my, my dreams, my visions, everything to you. My relationships, I submit them all to you. That is worshiping God in your spirit. You submit your emotions, your mind, and your will. That means when we come to church, if you want to worship God, you set aside the problems and the things in your life, and you just... Give yourself a vacation for a few minutes and just worship Jesus, knowing that Jesus is going to take care of him. 
you have embraced the truth of his word, therefore God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's going to work things out. He's going to work together for good for those who love God, all things. He's going to be with me in trouble, so on and so forth. What I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to concentrate on two important aspects of worship. Guys, whole books have been written on worship, but I'm going to um, concentrate on two aspects of worshiping here on Sunday morning corporately together. And this, this, this message is just not theological. It's just not theoretical. It's something that we have experienced here over and over again for almost 40 years. Ex um, <clears throat> There have been times in this church, especially in the 90s, when the Holy Spirit would come in with such power that people were falling off. They were all on the ground. Not all, but a lot of people on the ground. So much so, I, I don't, I tell them this, uh, because so much so that demons were manifesting in the middle of it, there's nothing we could do except kind of pray from afar. And people were coming from all over San Diego and... Um, the people who were, who were giving us the most problems were fellow Christians, but um, isn't that interesting? But all we would say, guys, we, and we had services every night for about six to eight months. I, I, I don't know. We had to. Um, and all we used to worship and have a short message, and then either Mark or I or whoever was leading the meeting would just say, would you, if you want to be touched by the Spirit, come forward. And we would just say, Holy Spirit, come. That's it. No manipulation, and I tell you, it was like an earthquake. And I can tell you a whole bunch of stuff about that. But, so I give you that history to, for you to understand that what, uh, what I'm about to share with you is not theological, it's not theoretical. We've experienced it, and are experiencing it now. We experienced some of it just a few minutes ago. The first uh, aspect of worship that I want to talk about this morning is, number one, we've been called to minister to the Lord. Acts, chapter 13, 1 to 2. There were at the church in Antioch prophets, teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord, there it is, fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. This phrase, ministering the Lord, gripped me. From the first time I saw it uh, in regards to what was happening at the church and what we were doing in worship, how do you minister to God? How do you, I mean, I know how I could minister to you if you're in the hospital or if you didn't have enough money. I mean, I know I can minister to you in the name of Jesus, but how do you minister to God? <coughs> Excuse me. If you look at the uh, Greek word to minister here, uh, it's letergoio, and it literally means a priestly service. It means a religious service. It's where we get our, our word liturgy from. These Christians, to, to, to cut to the chase here, these Christians in Antioch were fulfilling their priestly obligation, their priestly service. There's no tabernacle. There's no temple anymore. You're the temple of God. Now, this idea that you and I, as New Testament Christians, are a kingdom of priests should not be a new concept to most of you who've been Christians for any length of time. You know the Bible says you're priests. We're priests in the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 2.9. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. The apostle John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne of God. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. If that interests you, look at Isaiah chapter 11. Write it down. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. They'll tell you what the uh, prophet Isaiah will tell you what the seven spirits of God are. And from Jesus Christ, I am going quick, aren't I? <laughs> and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, releases us from our sins by his blood. Here it is. 
And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. It's obvious you and I, biblically, have been called to be priests. So what does that mean? How in the world are you and I a priest to God? Well, the first logical place to start is in the Old Testament, if I mean, it sounds logical to me. And priests in the Old Testament, um, well, they had certain duties, didn't they? Please, priests primarily were called, well, they were called to take care of the tabernacle and then the temple. But primarily, their job was to offer sacrifices, to oversee the offering of sacrifices to God for themselves and the people for their forgiveness of sins, and there was a whole um, list of other sacrifices and so on and so forth, right? But um, with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we enter in a new covenant through the blood of Jesus. That sacrificial system is done, right? We don't have to do that anymore. We New Testament priests, from what I can gather from the Bible, so I know this to be true, you and I only offer one sacrifice. We don't have to offer one sacrifice. Do you know what that is? Yourself. Romans chapter 12. The holy sacrifice you give to God now is simply giving God yourself. That's it. So, as New Testament priests, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. What is our function? The Bible says that we no longer live for ourselves, 2 Corinthians 5. But we live no longer live for ourselves, but he who died and rose again on our behalf. Now, besides overseeing sacrifices, the Old Testament priests had one other major function. I said all this to get to this. They had one other major function, and that was to sing and praise with instruments to God. Glorify God with singing and instruments. Second Chronicles 30, 20, 21. Who knows? The so <laughs> See, it's in there somewhere. The sons of Israel, present in Jerusalem, celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the seven days before Passover, for seven days with great joy. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day after day with loud instruments to the Lord. This is Hezekiah when they uh, reinstituted the Passover. So with, without question, I, there's a lot of other scriptures, one of the major functions of the priests and the Levites was, sing, was to sing to the Lord with musical instruments. So I've come to the conclusion, we have come to the conclusion, that as New Testament priests, you are a priest, every one of you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a priest to God. One of your major priestly functions is to worship God. And I would say, in song. You don't have to. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do to uh, worship God. So the, I, I have to move on. So the first basic um, aspect of worship is that you and I have been called to be ministers to the Lord. The second aspect of this worship is second act, important aspect of worship I want to look at this morning, is when we minister to the Lord, when we worship, number two, it assists you and others to experience God. Shane talked a little bit about that in his exhortation this morning. During the reign of King David, King David and, his, uh, and the priest, they trained people to worship, trained Levites, to worship God using different kinds. They experimented with different kinds of instruments. Not only that, they incorporated the congregation singing with them. Now, King David took worship very seriously. He understood something. He had experienced something. Worship in his own singing to, to the Lord. He understood that when you worship God, it produced faith. And that faith in God produced the presence of God and power. Even the commanders 
of the Israeli army understood this. Um, what do you know? I found this one. First, First Chronicles 25, verse 1. <clears throat> Read the whole chapter. It's very interesting. Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and Heman and Jehutham, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. The understanding that when God's people worship him, faith is produced, and that faith produces a, pers- a-, a-, a power in the presence of God, that truth was not overlooked by the commanders of the army. They understood that if Israel was surrounded by enemies, these commanders understood if they were going to defeat their enemies, they needed God's help. They needed God's power to be released when they went into battle. If you know anything about it, the worship leaders went first, (laughs) marched first into battle. First Chronicles 23, verse 15 tells us there were 4,000 of these trained Levites, and their function was to worship God with instruments and to encourage, and when they're in the temple, encourage other people to worship with them. Again, I believe David, the commanders of Israel, the priest, they learned an important truth. And this was it. This is it. Put it on the screen. Worship releases faith. Faith releases God's presence and power. I always, whenever I teach, I always want you to remember one thing. This is the one thing I want you to remember. If you leave here, I want you to remember this. Worship releases faith. Faith releases God's presence and power. Next time you need some faith, next time you need God's, you know, interjection into your life, spend some time worshiping him. Doesn't matter if you sound like a frog. Now, true worship isn't just singing, all right? I'll just quickly. Giving of your tithes and offerings, reading God's word, preaching, praying. These are all aspects of worship which produce faith, which produces a releasing of God's power and strength in your life. But here today, we're concentrating on corporately worshiping God together in song. Now, obviously, Paul understood the importance of this. Ephesians 5.19 speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to God. It's interesting. Paul Paul understood that when we're singing and worshiping God, there's something that not only happens between us and God, but happens corporately. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgivingness in your heart to God. Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and to make a long story short, they're arrested, they're thrown in jail, and what did they do when they're in jail? They start worshiping the Lord in song. And if you know the story, and if you don't know the story, you should read it. God's power comes, earthquake, and they're released from prison, the uh, jail, The head of the jail there, he gets saved, his family, and I would imagine a lot of others. Psalm 22.3. You can't read many worship uh, books that have been written the last uh, 25 years that don't talk about Psalm 22.3. Psalm 22.3 is an interesting verse, but if you look in the context, it's 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 not in the context of praising God. Jesus um, recited this psalm when he was on the cross. In other words, in the midst of some horrible thing in your life, think about praising God. The verse says that God inhabits or enthrones upon the praises of his people. So God either inhabits or enthrones depending on your translation. Now, some people say, well, isn't God already here? Yes. Doesn't God say that where two or three are gathered together, I'm in your midst? 
Yes. Doesn't Jesus and the Apostle Paul tell us explicitly that when you accept Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, he makes his abode with you? You are his temple? Yes. While all this is true, I also know from experience that when we worship God, we come together corporately, we worship God in spirit and in truth, a sense of God's presence will increase. Well, what is that? Spend a lot of time thinking, I mean, is it the wells of water, living water to break forth from our innermost being? Or is it just simply that God supernaturally visits us? Guys, I have the faintest idea. It's a complete mystery to me. And so I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out. If God would have wanted us to know, he would have told us explicitly. You can get a lot of books to try to explain it, but... No one can. It's a mystery. All I know is that true worship in spirit and in truth will release faith. And that faith releases God's power and presence. Power to push back to darkness, confusion, anxiety, depression, defeat, heal all sorts of maladies, bring conviction of sin. A hope that doesn't disappoint. Guys, what a miraculous thing. Shane was talking a little bit about it earlier. Your faith in worshiping God releases God's power to other people in this room. It's your priestly function. When we come together, your priestly function is to worship God, and that releases God's power and influence in this room to people who come in here. One of the, uh, there's two things that, that's on my heart every weekend. Number one, Lord Jesus, if it would be say, said about this church, that people who visit here or come, God is in that place. And secondly, that not one person would be able to resist your power and strength and the front would be filled with people uh, doing business with you. Do you see how, for those two things to happen, how important it is for you and I to take upon our priestly function seriously? Yes, you get to experience God, but that, uh, that is not, the ma I do not believe that's a major reason why we come and worship God. It's to release his power. It's interesting to me that people, you know, when, you, when you're in trouble, people want to isolate, the, you know, especially Christians. And this is the one place they need to be. If you're watching me right now, live, you maybe should be here. What a miraculous thing. That a bunch of us are worshiping over here, and this person over here who came in because his mother's been bugging him for years, he comes over here and the Holy Spirit falls on him. I don't mean to point at you, sir. I don't, I don't know you. <laughs> That's why in Hebrews chapter 10, 23 and 24, the Apostle Paul says, do not forsake the assembling together. And then he lists some of the things. This is why you don't, we encourage one another. We can, we, uh, all types of things happen here. Obedience, faith happens when we come together. Let me have the worship team back out here. Obviously, I could talk about, I'm really excited about this subject. I could talk about it a long time because it's not just theologically, again, it's not theoretical. I've experienced it. I'll, I've also learned that just because people aren't falling over, aren't crying, or whatever, doesn't mean God's power isn't here stronger than any of those times when those things happen. God is God. God moves in seasons. I used to be disappointed if people weren't, you know, after this thing happened in the 90s, if people weren't falling over, whatever, or crying, or, you know. I used to be disappointed, but then um, I can't go into some amazing things happened in people's life. They said, wait a minute. God is God. That was a season. All I know, let's all stand. When we worship God in spirit and truth, when we take on our priestly function, it releases faith in our life, and that faith releases his presence and power. So we're going to spend a few minutes uh, more this morning
engaging in our priestly function. So I'd ask you not to leave yet. I mean, I'll, I'll get you out on time. I mean, this service is 15 minutes shorter than the other one anyway. And I know some of you have already figured that out. <laughs> yeah. Nothing gets by me. No, I'm just kidding. So let's close out this time, and then uh, I'll, when, when it gets close to time then, uh, that we have to stop, I will um, have an altar call. So let's go ahead and let's sing for a few minutes, guys.